Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to talk about this topic and, and talk about an area that we can really have an effect for our patients, um, especially with neurological diseases and cognitive diseases. Uh, so our topic today is going to be neurological genomics and how to assess and apply therapies to those. And specifically, we're going to be looking beyond the APOE gene. So there's, uh, APOE is the most common uh, gene that gets focused on when it comes to neurological health and, and assessment for Alzheimer's disease and things like that. And so what we're really going to focus in on are some other genes that we can also pay attention to with our genomics. Um, so our objectives for today uh, will be to discuss the relevance of genomics in neurological assessment and therapeutics, uh, provide a basic overview of genomic insight and Opus 23 Explorer, uh, review the genes and SNPs associated uh, in the neurological report within genomic insight, uh, discuss other relevant genes and SNPs to check on outside of that report, and then we'll also do a live curation so you can actually see how we will put together a report uh, for a patient who's either concerned about having risk factors or someone in the early stages of this disease. And so just a quick um, overview of both Genomic Insight and Opus 23 before we get started. Some of you uh, on the webinar today have, are probably already Genomic Insight and Opus 23 Explorer users, but for those of you who aren't, I just wanted to cover the, this right at the beginning here. Uh, so Genomic Insight is a test that reports on over 5,000 uh, SNPs in one comprehensive functional DNA test, and it's a saliva test. Uh, therapeutic recommendations within uh, Opus Explorer and Genomic Insight are all backed by the latest medical literature from PubMed, GWIS, uh, DBSNP, HapMap, and, and many other sources that are well respected in the genetics genomics community. Um, and then, so Genomic Insight uses the latest med medical literature to provide relevant information, uh, not only on the genes themselves, but also any nutrients, uh, supplements, diet, lifestyle changes, uh, things that your patients and clients can proactively do uh, to reduce or prevent their risk of different diseases. So what exactly is Opus 23 Explorer? Um, so Opus Explorer is a tool to analyze the data that comes from the DSL Genomic Insight Test. Uh, within Opus Explorer, there's multiple analytics applications that are rolled into a single program. Uh, provides the information visually in a visually friendly way uh, to present complex information uh, that can be kind of overwhelming for, for even people who are well versed in this field. Uh, provides that information in a way that's visually appealing and that you can actually help with communicating with your clients their results and, and provide them with reports that are um, user friendly and, and readable by someone who may not be as well versed in genetics as yourself. Um, all data is sourced from peer reviewed and science based articles. Uh, it's a, and more importantly, it's, it's a new tool that can help engage your patients and clients um, with this type of information. So many patients ask, you know, their doctors to interpret uh, their genetic data from a variety of other sources. And so what, th what this test does and this tool does is it allows you to analyze that information for them, provide them with reports, give them information on pharmaceutical and etiological concerns, as well as those supplemental diet and lifestyle recommendations too. So when we're talking about uh, neurological disease, um, you know, the, the biggest and, and kind of most common one that people are concerned around are, is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we'll talk specifically about Alzheimer's disease pretty frequently throughout this presentation, but a lot of the areas that we're focusing in on can also be applied to other neurological conditions. So things like beyond Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, post-concussive syndrome uh, and stroke uh, CVA recovery, as well as any kind of chronic neuroinflammation that our people are struggling with, and really anything uh, having to do with neurological decline or, or neurological issues that people are having. Um, and so what we're gonna focus really in on today are the genes that are listed in uh, this neurodegenerative genomics area. And so this is actually a, a screen grab from the Opus 23 Explorer tool. And what it's looking at is actually the genes that are related to neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, as you can see right here at the top, at the very top of that dial there is your APOE gene, but then there's also a whole host of other ones that can be involved for people. Um, the, the kind of dials in the center there are actually a, uh, a patient's genomic data overlaid on those genes. And so where you see orange on those uh, middle dials, that's where they actually have homozygous mutations present. 
uh, yellow on those dials, which you can see a small yellow one going out towards caspase base one on the left. Uh, that's actually a heterozygous mutation. Uh, and then lastly, we have the, um, the gray on there, which means they have normal wild types, so no mutations present there. Every once in a while, you'll also see a green um, bar sneak up on these types of reports, and that actually means that they have a beneficial, beneficial mutation present. So something actually confers uh, less risk of disease for those individuals. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk about the most important ones today in relation to specifically Alzheimer's disease. Um, but once again, these can be applied to also um, uh, other neurological concerns. And then I'll also talk about a couple of genes that um, I've really been doing a, a lot of focus in on it and research related to um, that aren't necessarily included in the report that you can also add in separately within the Opus 23 Explorer. Uh, and so um, just to give a brief overview of Alzheimer's disease, uh, once again, most people um, on the webinar here are going to be very uh, familiar with the disease, but just to kind of set the baseline for all of us. So currently 47 million people do live with a form of dementia globally. Uh, it's a staggering amount of people and Alzheimer's disease is one of the most major uh, causative factors of that dementia. Uh, 5.3 million Americans have been diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's disease. And this is, um, you know, characterized by a, a memory loss and pro progressive uh, neurocognitive dysfunction. Um, so what, what's going on at the cellular level, right? What's going on within the neurons? And so the following hallmarks are usually present. So there's extracellular aggregation of amyloid beta plaque uh, between the neurons. Um, and so this usually begins in the cortex, but then eventually spreads to the hippocampus, to the amygdala, diencephalon, and basal ganglia. Uh, intracellularly, we see neurofibrillary tangles of tau protein in the cortex and the limbic areas of the brain. Uh, and then we also, diagnosis is primarily based on neuropsychological testing currently, but they can also um, monitor levels of amyloid beta peptides and tau protein in, in the CSF fluid via a spinal tap, for example. But largely, this diagnosis is usually made on uh, neuropsych testing. Um, so what are our contributors here? And, and this is where we want to start focusing in on the genomics piece here. So there's absolutely a genetic correlation with uh, Alzheimer's disease, um, APOE being one of the big players, but we're going to talk about a lot of other ones today too. Uh, elevated oxidative stress in the brain, inflammation, uh, central nervous system toxins, so such as heavy metals, uh, chronic infections, and dysglycemia. Um, all of these areas are ripe areas to explore from, uh, you know, not only from a standard lab test perspective, but also from a genomic perspective. So, you know, beyond just the, the genes that are associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease or, or, or cognitive decline, we can also look at areas, okay, does this individual have problem controlling their blood sugar? Um, it, Alzheimer's is commonly being referred to as a, a type 3 diabetes. Um, do they have any chronic infections? Do they have any uh, potential toxin overload of heavy metals going on in the central nervous system? Have they always had chronic inflammation or chronic oxidative stress going on? So these are all areas that you can investigate, uh, not only from you know, your standard lab tests, but also from a genomic perspective to see if they have any trouble resolving inflammation, resolving oxidative stress, uh, clearing out infections or toxins or, or controlling their blood sugar. Um, and so within the neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative genomics report, um, well, you know, the first and, and biggest one, once again, it's APOE, right? So having those, uh, those APOE4, E4 uh, mutations that confer a much higher risk is really our biggest player. Um, we could probably do an entire webinar on APOE gene, and that might be something that we do in the future. Uh, but we, what we really want to focus in on today are other genes that can be involved this process. So some of the ones are APP, three different caspase genes, which we'll talk about, uh, NFE2L2, which is one of our major antioxidant genes, uh, TNF, uh, tumor necrosis factor, which is involved in chronic inflammation and, and upregulation of inflammatory cytokines. Uh, and then lastly, uh, presenilin genes as well, uh, one and two. And so we'll talk about how each one of those individually can be a contributor and why these are areas that you should be checking out with your uh, with your patients. And so to start out with um, an area that I think, you know, if, if we had kind of like a second player here to, to APOE, one of the most important areas to check in on are the cast bases for these individuals who either have a strong family history or have, uh, have you know, are being diagnosed with the early stages of Alzheimer's. Um, cast bases are proteins that are involved in apoptosis. 
and apoptosis is pre-programmed cell death. So every one of our cells, whether they're neurons or, or you know, cells throughout the rest of our body, they undergo this apoptosis process just as a regular um, turnover process and renewal process for cells. Um, and so this is a pre-programmed process that's actually a good thing that should occur for people. Um, and sequential activation of the individual caspases is what plays a central role in completion of that apoptosis process. So if someone has, into, someone has uh, SNPs that are relevant in these genes, can absolutely cause hangups in that apoptosis cascade and, and be a major player in terms of um, them not being able to turn over uh, the neuronal health regularly. Um, caspase 3 is the predominant caspase involved in cleavage of amyloid beta precursor proteins, uh, and caspase 1 and 8 are being studied for their roles in the pathogenesis of, of Parkinson's disease. So as you can see here, um, absolutely involved in sort of these neurological diseases, both amyloid beta plaques, so obviously Alzheimer's, but then also Parkinson's as well as being investigated with these caspase genes. So some relevant SNPs for this. Um, so uh, I'll spare you uh, reading off the, the RS numbers every time, but I do have the RS numbers listed as well as the risk alleles. So the risk allele for this would be A. Um, and so, and, and uh, just as a side note, anytime that we're listing out SNPs throughout this PowerPoint, uh, those are included on the Genomic Insight Opus 23 Explorer dashboard. So you're actually able to check every one of these for your clients that you've run this test on and are, are using Opus Explorer for. Um, out to the right, so uh, one of the most um, uh, visually appealing and, and awesome tools that we have within Opus Explorer are these fingerprint, uh, these agent expression fingerprints for specific genes. And so what we're looking at on the right side of the screen here is actually the, what agents have been shown to have research in affecting caspase 3 function, whether it's transcription, whether it's upregulating the activity of the gene, whether it's helping uh, uh, the, the overall function in general. Um, these are the genes, or these are the agents that actually have some research uh, in terms of what, what we can be focusing on to give people. The strongest agonists that we see are ginkgo, uh, gossypium, and sephora, which are three different herbs, and then also butyric acid, uh, which, which comes from ghee and is also synthesized in our colon by our gut microbiome, uh, bromelain, calcium deglucrate, resveratrol, and L-theanine. Those are some of the stronger ones, and you can see out to the right. So the relative magnitude of that bar over of, of the different bars there, so you can see like one, two, and three as it goes further out. That's how robust the research is on those individual agents. So where the bar is pointing, for example, in the top large one there, resveratrol is what it's pointing to. Um, you can see that there's a, a, a large, robust amount of evidence that it actually does help with. Uh, upregulating caspase three, and what this does too is when you're when you're viewing this within the program, and I can show this, but we're doing live curation later, uh, is you can actually go to the original studies that show that. So you can actually see, okay, so where these animal studies or these human studies uh, are, this is an accumulation of um, in, in vitro studies. Uh, and so you can actually look at what, um, where that research comes from. And then you see two colors of bars there. So when a bar is orange, that means it's an antagonist of the gene. And then when the bar is green, that means it's an agonist of the gene. Antagonist meaning that it, up, up, that it down regulates the function. Agonist meaning that it up regulates the function. With caspase one, so once again, uh, the relevant SNP is, is right there listed. Uh, some of our stronger agonists for this are actually inositol, uh, curcumin, uh, salacia, and then also jackfruit. Um, and you can see that agent fingerprint pattern out there on the right. Uh, once again, that lists the antagonists and the agonists. And with these caspase uh, genes specifically, you would really want to focus in on ways to upregulate them, right? So they help with that process of clearing that amyloid beta uh, precursor protein, clearing out um, old senescent cells in, in the neurological system. Um, and so you would actually want to be focusing on upregulating these things. And that's why I've listed out the agonists. And then the last one of our caspases here. Uh, so the um, uh, is caspase eight, a couple of relevant SNPs here, um, and then a couple of agonists that show up once again are Sephora and Gossypium. Um, and, and once again, you have the agent fingerprint pattern up here. And so there's also, you know, beyond just the major ones that I list out there on the left side, there's a whole host of other ones that have research as well. And, uh, just a point I would like to make is that the, the, um, 
the level of research and which agents have an effect on these genes is constantly being updated within Opus 23. Uh, so there are curators uh, who are, are every once in a while for whatever gene you know we're working on or focusing in on, we'll also check the most recent research in PubMed. And if there's anything new that's come out, not only on one of the agents that are already listed out there, but if there's a new agent, let's say, you know, research comes out on um, you know, Scutellaria or some other herb, right? We'll actually throw that into the um, into the agent fingerprint pattern. So you're actually getting the most up to date research in terms of uh, what agents are having an effect on these genes. Um, our next gene, so outside of our um, cast bases now, is a gene called APP, which stands for amyloid beta precursor protein. Um, this gene forms the pre or forms the proteins that are the basis of amyloid plaques. Um, two of these subpeptides uh, of APP actually have antibacterial and antifungal properties. Um, there's been uh, there's research and, and theories around um, uh, of potential forms of Alzheimer's and, and cognitive decline being triggered by. Uh, chronic infections uh, that have, have made their way into the central nervous system. And so it's interesting that this protein actually does have those antibacterial, antifungal properties. And uh, one of the genes that's actually being investigated in terms of that theory as well. Um, mutations in this gene are uh, specifically implicated in autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, which is an inherited form of the disease, as well as cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, some relevant SNPs here. So uh, for, for APP itself. Um, so with, there's three major ones within Opus that are uh, have a robust amount of research present, but then there are also several other that are reported within Opus as well that, um, that uh, don't have as strong research, but we're tracking them just for potential future um, aspects of that. And then antagonists, so we would actually want to be down-regulating this gene. A uh, strong antagonist of this amyloid precursor protein is actually selenium. Um, just a note also on this, uh, several other SNPs that are reported in Opus Explorer. So similar to how the agents are constantly being updated with new research, um, Opus is always pulling the most up-to-date information from whether it's GWAS, which are genome-wide association studies, um, different HapMap studies, different DB SNP studies. And so just because a specific SNP within Opus Explorer and a, a SNP that we're tracking in Genomic Insight doesn't necessarily have research associated with some of the diseases we're talking about now, doesn't mean that in the future when more GWAS studies are performed and more genomic studies are performed, um, that we won't necessarily have some more research to pull from to say, hey, this, uh, this SNP that we weren't, uh, didn't necessarily have research on before actually now has a robust amount of research linking it to such and such disease. And so, you know, that's another huge time saver that clients see with using Opus Explorer and Genomic Insight is that they're not, they're no longer having to do all this research on their own. Opus is constantly pulling in all of that research and making it a simple, central hub that, where you can actually access that all at once and get the most up-to-date information without having to spend, you know, your valuable time crawling through PubMed or looking up for new GWA studies or things like that. Um, the next gene I want to talk about was, so it's called NFE2L2, and it codes for a protein called NERF2. Um, this is actually a, a gene involved and a protein involved in a whole host of different functions beyond just uh, neurodegenerative and, and neurocognitive decline. Um, NFE2L2 is strongly updated. Uh, uh, upregulated in response to oxidative stress, and this occurs everywhere in the body, not just within the central nervous system. Um, it's stored in cell cytoplasm under normal conditions. However, under oxidative stress, this actually translocates to the nucleus where it binds DNA promoters and initi initiate transcription of antioxidant genes and their subsequent proteins. That's why we call it a master transcription factor when it comes to these antioxidant genes because essentially it, it, it detects that oxidative stress occurring. It goes straight into the nucleus and then upregulates a whole host of antioxidant genes in and of itself. Um, and then there's SNPs associated uh, within NFE2L2 are associated with uh, disease progression, specifically Alzheimer's disease progression and severity, not necessarily susceptibility though, right? So just because someone has these SNPs present in NFE2L2 doesn't mean they're more susceptible to Alzheimer's, but it is associated with once they've been diagnosed or they're starting to have initial symptoms, they, are, they have a faster disease progression and also a higher severity of the disease in itself. 
Um, two of the relevant steps here are listed out. And the strong agonist, and, and the strongest one with the most research is sulforaphane. Um, the the uh, sulforaphane is found in high concentration in cruciferous vegetables and in the highest concentration in broccoli sprouts. Um, a lot of people will have their own, like you make their own, uh, sprout their own broccoli sprouts at home, uh, but you can also get sulforaphane in a supplemental form as well. Other strong agonists of this are curcumin, uh, shenandra, melatonin, and butyric acid showing up again here. Um, and then beyond those out on the right, you can also see that agent fingerprint expression right there. Um, and then a couple of other genes here. So our presenilin genes, so PSEN1 and PSEN2. Um, mutations in either one of these genes uh, result in an increased production of longer forms of amyloid beta, which are more difficult to um, clear out after they've been produced because it's a longer, uh, longer, longer protein there. Um, they regulate APP processing through the effects on gamma secretase enzyme. Uh, and gamma secretase is an enzyme that actually cleaves APP. And so uh, what, the way that the presenolins work is they actually upregulate this gamma secretase uh, to actually start helping to clear out some of that amyloid precursor protein. And so when individuals have SNPs that are present in PSEN1 or in PSEN2, uh, they actually have a more difficult time clearing out that, uh, that amyloid precursor protein. Uh, a multitude of SNPs are currently involved in being researched in terms of their relation to Alzheimer's disease. And within Opus, um, that, you know, this is one that is a good FYI for your patients, right? Um, not necessarily, we don't have any clear agents that have been identified yet. You know, as research comes out, we're constantly updating this. Um, but it is good to check this because um, it can it can provide patients information in terms of you know relative risk and relative um, uh, risk of severity of Alzheimer's and other neurocognitive diseases. And then we also have tumor necrosis factor TNF. Uh, this is another one that uh, most individuals who are, are familiar with either genomics or, or kind of just the molecular basis of inflammation. Um, this is another very uh, important one when it comes to inflammation. It's a multifunctional pro-inflammatory cytokine that is secreted by macrophages. Um, and it's considered to be uh, the master regulator of the inflammatory response in multiple organs beyond just the central nervous system. Uh, it is, has been seen to be upregulated in uh, the central nervous system in Alzheimer's disease and exacerbates accumulation of tau protein and amyloid beta. So essentially when someone has the high levels of chronic inflammation, which going back to you know, one of those original slides, that being a contributor to Alzheimer's disease, um, we do see that this is uh, upregulated in those cases. Uh, a couple of relevant SNPs there that are checked on by Opus. Um, and then antagonists would be ginkgo biloba, theanine, curcumin, fish oil, resveratrol, NIC, and then actually yerba mate. Um, you can see out there on the right some other agents that are listed as well. Um, and and uh, just to point this out too, so sometimes you'll see actually that there's an orange bar layered on top of a green bar, uh, as you see on there for large arabinogalactan right now, um, on the right side of that dial. Uh, that actually means that the research is conflicting. Uh, I should have pointed that out at the start. And so there's actually research that's shown that uh, LARCH can upregulate this gene and also downregulate this gene. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, then, you know, if, if you're wanting to go in a clear cut direction, um, you know, probably be, you know, not a good idea to be using that because it's just the research is a little bit conflicted. Um, and, and the reason we include that is because, you know, we want to be including all research, not just ones that push. Oh, you know, it com confirms our um, thoughts that this was an agonist or confirms our thoughts that it was an antagonist. So anytime that there is conflicting research that we've, we've dug into, you'll see that there's that combination of bars present. Um, so you know that, you know, there's a little bit of confliction there right now. And then some other um, relevant genes that I just wanted to touch on um, that, I, that I specifically have been, have been really focusing in on and doing a lot of research on lately are these uh, genes and proteins called neurotrophins. Two of the big ones, and you've probably heard of these before, are BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and then NGF, which is nerve growth factor. Um, so two of these that I wanted to also touch on before we started the live duration portion. Um, so what are these neurotrophin proteins? Uh, so neurotrophin comes from the word trophico, the Greek word trophikos, which stands for um, 
nourishing. And so when you put those two together, neurotrophin means neuron nourishing. And so this is a class of proteins that are involved in the survival, growth, function of neurons. Uh, they perform actions in both the CNS and the PNS, peripheral nervous system and central nervous system. Uh, they uh, role spanning from embryonic development all the way up to maintaining uh, and, and nourishing mature neurons. Uh, they are secreted as precursors called pro-neurotrophins that are eventually cleaved to become mature neurotrophins. Uh, and pro-neurotrophins are also active. Um, so these pro versions, even before they've been cleaved to become their you know, mature versions, they are still active in performing functions. Um, uh, specifically what actions they do. So neuroplasticity in the hippocampus. Uh, so it's involved in learning memory, uh, neurogenesis, uh, neuroregeneration, neuroprotection, cognitive enhancement, um, apoptosis, uh, and um, uh, which is that process of pre-programmed cell death that we talked about earlier. Um, just before I start talking about the individual ones, so there is a lot of research on the pharmaceutical side when it comes to these neurotrophins right now. Um, they are mainly using uh, recombinant neurotrophins and, and using those as, as medications. However, because of, of the um, strong effects that the, these have on the nerves, um, common side effects when, you know, kind of like taking that sledgehammer approach, right? Or, or myalgia, so muscle pain, arthralgia, uh, which is joint pain, and then also um, uh, just an increased sensitivity to pain in general. And so the pharmaceutical approach is, is to just kind of blanket upregulate all these things and use a really high dose of things. Uh, that, those, that is in um, stage two and stage three clinical trials right now, and, but they are seeing a lot of side effects. And so the, the approach that we take with these things is using different herbs or nutrients uh, or, or supplements, things like that, to actually upregulate our endogenous production. So without kind of taking that, you know, sledgehammer approach where we just dump a bunch of this stuff into the system, uh, we actually do do that subtle sort of endogenous increase in these to help um, overall function in general without, you know, completely overwhelming the symptom, uh, overwhelming the system and getting those, um, uh, you know, side effects that we want to avoid for our patients. So the first one is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So this acts in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, like, I, like I said earlier, it's secreted as pro-BDNF, which undergoes enzymatic cleavage to form BDNF. This supports neuronal survival, growth and differentiation, and genesis of new adult neurons and synapses, um, stabilizes those synapse dendrite connections um, in the central nervous system where it acts is in the hippocampus, the cortex, and the basal forebrain. And then in the peripheral nervous system, it acts in the retina, motor neurons, and skeletal muscle. Uh, it's involved in learning, memory, and sensory motor function. So obviously, a wide-ranging effects appear in regards to neurological function. Um, the most uh, relevant SNP and one with the most research right now are, is RS6265. It does have a significant association with reduced hippocampal size and common in individuals with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, memory and learning disorders, uh, and anxiety disorders. Um, the TT geno genotype, which, was, which is when someone has a homozygous uh, mutation present in that SNP, confers a 2.6x increased uh, risk of motor skill, uh, impaired motor skill learning, quicker mental decline in Alzheimer's. And then even the heterozygous version of that, so CT actually still has a 26 X increased risk for ADHD, depression, and a quicker mental decline in Alzheimer's as well. So even having a heterozygous mutation in the SNP uh, does, you know, kind of set off a red flag for it for someone who's been um, diagnosed with any of these things. Our major players when it comes to BDNF are lion's mane mushroom, uh, Heresium arenaceus. Uh, a lot of research going on um, in terms of the nootropic and um, neurological effects of that mushroom right now. Cuprazine, uh, cuprazine A from the herb Cuprazia serrata, and then rhodiola as well. Um, and then, as you can see on the right, there's a whole host of other um, agonists and antagonists that are being uh, um, researched right now, and you would want to pay attention to the agonists for that. Um, and then our other neurotrophin that I wanted to um, touch on is nerve growth factor. So this one is involved in the growth, maintenance, and survival of neurons. Uh, both sympathetic and sensory neurons undergo apoptosis in its absence. 
Um, the functions of this are neuronal proliferation, pancreatic beta cell survival. There's actually a little bit of research going on in type one diabetes with this neurotrophin right now. Uh, and then also regulation of the immune system and chronic inflammation as well. Um, it does reduce neuronal degeneration and reduces central nervous system inflammation and helps to repair myelin uh, when, when damage has occurred to the myelin specifically. Two of our relevant steps for this one are RS6330, um, uh, which uh, confers a susceptibility to ADHD, late onset Alzheimer's, and mild cognitive impairment. And then another one, uh, RS4332358, uh, which is associations with primary affective disorders and schizophrenia as well. So as you can see, not only with um, neurological diseases and, and cognitive decline, uh, but we also have a whole host of other sort of mental um, and, and affective diseases that, uh, that are associated with these as well because of their wide ranging effects. Uh, so our nerve, uh, nerve growth factor, so Herbal and nutrient agonists would be, once again, lion's mane, rhodiola, and herisine showing up as, as very strong agonists for this. And then another mushroom in that herisium family, actually called combed, comb tooth cap mushroom, uh, PQQ and lupiol, uh, which are or lupiol, uh, which is found in mango and dandelion root. And then also some dietary and lifestyle agonists of this are is uh, cold stress actually. So doing hypothermia treatments, whether that's ice baths, cold showers, things like that, uh, or, or even cryotherapy for individuals who have access to cryo, um, does has been shown to upregulate this nerve growth factor. And then now I want to switch over for our, for our, our end of our presentation here to a live report curation. So you can actually see this in action. Um, and see how Opus 23 works. So give me a second here while I switch over the screen share. Okay, perfect. So you should be able to see um, my, uh, my Chrome browser now, which has a, uh, let me just adjust the size of this really fast so you can see the whole thing. Okay, there we go. Um, so you now should be able to see my Chrome browser, uh, which I, I've got um, a dummy patient data, Jane Doe, uploaded right now. Um, and so this is what you first see when you upload a patient into uh, Opus 23 Explorer. Um, on the left side, just to kind of, for, for everyone, for individuals who are currently Opus 23 Explorer users, um, on the left side, you've kind of got your navigation bar here where you have your account management, where you can list load different patients. So if you have multiple patients, this is where you would go to switch between that. And then you have all these data management tabs where you can actually go in and investigate your individual client's genes. And so when you've got a patient uploaded in here, anytime you click on these data management aspects, it's going to be analyzing and parsing through the, gene uh, the genetics of that individual patient. And so specifically with the, with, um, just to show the report wizard at the start here, you can just go in and click one of these specific areas and generate a basic report, depending on what areas you want to customize, methylation, or what areas you want to focus in on. So methylation, detox, cognition, inflammation, all these different areas, you can just generate a blanket report based on that genetics, that patient genetics, print it out and you're ready to go. Or if you're wanting to do a little bit more of a deep dive and actually individually curate a report for a patient, uh, which is what we're gonna do for the um, neurological piece here, you would actually use some of these other tabs. And so for, just to go through them at the start here, your SNP navigator, which shows your, um, all of the different genes that are being tracked in SNPs for this patient. You can go up here and put in the word Alzheimer and it'll pull up all the ones related to Alzheimer. You can go in here and type in the word Parkinson or and you'll pull up all of um, every gene that has the word Parkinson. In it. Um, and then for network maps, you can go in here and see actual network maps. Uh, so for example, our methylation map, uh, which shows our um, all, not only the whole methylation cascade, but the client's actual genetics overlaid onto that cascade. And once again, anywhere you see orange, this is a common theme. That means they have homozygous mutation present. You can see they have some homozygous med present down on their MTHFR gene here. Yellow means heterozygous, and then gray means normal wild type. And then where I actually want to focus in on is our syndrome templates. So this is where I actually uh, took that screen grab from earlier for our neurological genomics or neurodegenerative genomics. And so up here you see gastrointestinal, thyroid, adipocytokine, right here neurodegenerative where we're going to focus. 
Um, and then you, you know, a whole host of other ones as you begin scrolling. And so when you have a, a patient coming in with a specific chief complaint or a specific chief concern, hey, I have a really strong family history of Alzheimer's. Hey, I was recently diagnosed with this or my, or my parent or my grandparent was diagnosed with this. Um, this is where you uh, can go in and actually individually curate all of the genes that this individual has positive for either homozygous or heterozygous SNPs um, and actually generate the report from that. So I already went in and clicked this curate button, so I won't click it again. And when we click curate, that means it adds it to the patient's report. Um, and then I also, so we also talked a little bit about those neurotrophic genes, right? And so what you can actually do is going back up to our SNP navigator. I had gone in um, and I already typed in BD and F. And so you can see here where this little cure um, it, uh, column is, that means curate. And so I click this button, you'll notice that the BD and F gene, when you click one of them, it does all of them um, for all the different SNPs. This, these ones down here are gray. This one, because I clicked on that gene to curate it, it's already blue. And then the other neurotrophin that we talked about, our growth factor, is right here. Um, and so you can actually go in and click those as well. Once again, when you click one of them, it clicks both the SNPs. Um, and then, so now on my curation report, not only will it have all those neurodegenerative genomics on there, but it will also have the uh, individual genes that I selected. And then lastly, on the prescriptive tools. So if you want to recommend some specific herbs or nutrients or supplements, I've gone in based on them having some SNPs present in their NGF, in their BDNF, and some of the individual um, uh, individual neurodegenerative genes that we had talked about. I had gone in and actually already chosen a couple of the herbs that are based on those. Um, and so once again, those are already checked because I had gone in advance so that um, you know, didn't spend a bunch of time searching for everything during the presentation. Uh, and then lastly here, so after you've gone in, so I've clicked a couple of the genes that I'm interested in. I clicked the neurodegenerative syndrome, uh, and then I picked some agents that I want to recommend based on those genomics and based on their clinical presentation. You come down here to the um, curation editor, which will show everything that you clicked. So once again, it shows BDNF, NGF, neurodegenerative genomics, um, and then also uh, the four prescriptives that I recommended. And then after you hit those, you've got those clicked, you would click generate client report. And now you've got your client report. So it's just as easy as that. Um, and it essentially develops this entire report for you. Um, so you don't have to type in all this information and explain everything. Um, this prints out, you can either save it as a, as a PDF from Chrome or you can print it on paper if you're discussing these things in person for your patient. At the start here, it has um, just some specifics about the Genomic Insight Test, about Opus 23 Explorer. Um, it talks to, you know, if you've ever had to explain kind of complex topics of genetics to a patient or genomics to a patient, um, it does that for you here so they can kind of read through that on their own time. Um, and then it talks about the structure of the report. And so you can see the independently curated genes. So uh, clicking on or, or showing CYP1B1 as an example, this isn't one that we clicked. Um, is so when you see orange, that means that that's the cumulative amount of homozygous genes or homozygous SNPs present, yellow being heterozygous SNPs present, green being beneficial SNPs present, gray being wild type, no SNPs present. Um, it'll also show the agents that you selected and then any um, in individual products. And so for the genes that I actually picked, so BDNF being the first one, it actually puts together a nice kind of user-friendly description for the patient, one that they can actually understand. If there's any words in here that are kind of like complex genetic talk or, or genomic talk, it will actually define it here using this owl. So this is kind of like a running glossary for your patient. Um, and then it'll tell, tell them if you had picked any agents that are associated with helping the function of these SNPs or the function of the, the gene. Um, and so we had picked Heresia marinaceus, which is lion's mane mushroom. Uh, same thing for NGF. Um, and then there is, uh, and, and with NGF, because they actually don't have any of those um, uh, significant SNPs to report, it doesn't actually show any of that data because there's just nothing to report for them there. I just chosen it because it was one of those um, uh, neurotropins that we talked about. And then it will go down into the area of the report that talks about the neurodegenerative genomics that we just spoke about. So anytime they had a positive SNP 
pre or positive um, either homozygous or heterozygous genes present. Uh, heterozygous or homozygous SNPs present. Sorry, I get, get tricked up on those sometimes, even myself. Um, the uh, they'll talk about that gene individually. Uh, the um, the running glossary here, and then also the selected agents. So we talked about ginkgo and rhodiola, so I clipped those in there as well. Same thing for TNF. So it'll talk about the individual SNPs that they were positive for, a user-friendly explanation, and once again, those agents that I clicked. Any multi-SNPs. So these are interactive algorithms that are included in the um, uh, in the neurodegenerative section that they tested positive for. They didn't have any algorithms that they tested positive for, so it's not showing any. And then lastly, any drug interactions based on their genomics that they should be aware of. These are just outside of our, of, you know, the, the neurodegenerative um, uh, kind of scope of the report. So, but it includes any sort of pharmaceutical reaction they should be aware of. A lot of chemotherapy, blood pressure medications, pain medications are included in here. And then lastly, any of the natural products, A, that we chose, or B, that were recommended based on their relative indication. So you can even see some of the ones that we had talked about that were beneficial for some of those neurodegenerative genes, uh, curcumin, resveratrol, sulforaphane, uh, selenium, all are showing up as well indicated. And the ones that they highlight in blue are the ones that you had actually chosen. Uh, and recommended. Um, you can obviously go back and, and click other ones and then they'll show up blue as well. And then lastly, if you had chosen any maps that you wanted to talk about with your clients, so whether you wanted to talk about a methylation map, you know, have their genetics actively overlaid on it, it would show that at the end here. Or if you wanted to talk about their phase, phase one, two detox, or any of those sort of uh, network maps that are included within Open Explorer, you can actually include in their report at the end. Um, and then let me just go back over here. Let me just switch back to my PowerPoint. And so, the, and just to recap, this is the report. So you would save this as a PDF or print it out um, and um, talk through this with them. And, and what's also great about Opus, so, you know, A, if they have concerns around family history of Alzheimer's or consult or, you know, someone or they, they've been recently diagnosed or something like that. You can develop a report for them for them, but what if they come in with a different condition? Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, I mean, any myriad of hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, I mean, basically any condition, you can investigate and develop a report for them based on that genomic data. And so beyond this uh, sort of scope of neurodegenerative disease, this tool can be used for a whole host of other things as well. And, and what we recovered today was, um, you know, the, the major hitters in terms of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, beyond that APOE gene uh, so that you have some more familiarity and some of the lesser well-known ones that can be affecting uh, 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 outcomes for a patient who's concerned around these um, sort of cognitive decline uh, picture. Let me switch back to my PowerPoint here. Okay, and so you should be able to see the PowerPoint again. And so just to recap, you know, we, we discussed um, a whole host of genes that are recorded um, recommended based on that neurodegenerative genomic sort of sundial there and that report will automatically include any of the ones that showed up as positive for the patient. And then we also discussed those neurotropin genes that um, are, are involved in um, the potential for severity and, and different types of Alzheimer's and using those, uh, using different herbs and nutrients and things like that to actually upregulate the endogenous production of those uh, neurotropins. Um, so, you know, hopefully today was hope, uh, helpful in terms of learning a little bit more about um, genes that are involved in Alzheimer's and, and um, cognitive decline and really any of those areas that you want to investigate for your clients using genomics. Um, and, I, you know, I always end up saying, you know, genomics is, is one piece of the puzzle for these individuals, right? And so this is an area that's ripe for exploring and, and helping these individuals get a better grasp of if there is sort of a genomic basis for them. But at the end of the day, you also want to be paying attention to any of those other factors, right? Their personal medical history, their family history. I mean, all these different aspects, um, they all kind of come together in the clinical picture for your patients. But this is definitely a piece of that puzzle that can actually help with um, not only determining if there is some sort of genomic risk and some sort of um, you know, aspect to be discovered there, but then also 
customizing and personalizing their protocol based on those areas that are compromised for them. And so, you know, if they don't have any mutations in the neurotrophins, if they don't have any mutations in some of those neurodegenerative um, genomics that we talked about, that's also good information, right? So you know that there's maybe more of an environmental or external factor in play here. Whereas if they show up positive for a whole host of those SNPs and a whole host of those genes having mutations, um, then you know you need to focus in and hone in on those things as well. And so, um, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, watch the or uh, come to the presentation and, and come to the webinar today. Um, I, I really hope you enjoyed it. And um, thank you again for attending.